And so while we're in uh, uh, 2 Peter, I want to look at this, that we're look, talking about a living faith, actually for a spiritual life. But to have a living faith, it requires that you pay attention. You've got to pay attention. You know, uh, every now and then, because uh, I'm kind of like the absent-minded professor, I'm thinking, you know, on uh, one thing, and, and my wife says, okay, I want you to go to the store and get me some brown rice. This truly happened. So I go to the Kroger, and I'm thinking, okay, now, she wanted something brown. So I buy brown sugar. <laughs> so I'm driving home. I get home, and I'm pulling into the garage, and I look, and I see, I got brown sugar. Now, she's making a recipe, and she's not doing sugar right now, so why did I buy brown sugar? And then it dawns on me. When I really start thinking, she wanted brown rice. So I quietly back out of the garage. I drive my way back to the Kroger. I exchange the, the brown sugar. I go find the brown rice. I go and I, I check out. I drive home. I go in and say, honey, here's the brown rice. And she never asked me what took so long. I was... I pulled it off until this moment. <laughs> I tend to be a little bit absent-minded and I'm not paying attention because I, I, I think like a lot of guys, we're one-track mind, we're not multitaskers, and somebody's talking to me, but my mind is somewhere else, and I'm not paying attention, and I think people go through their Christian life like that. Not giving God or paying the Word its full attention. We should be paying more attention. The key phrase today is found in 2 Peter 1.19. It says, you will do well to pay attention to. Pay attention. Pay attention. So years ago, my dad came down to visit me while I was uh, preaching in Ohio, a young pastor. My dad come down on Father's Day. They celebrated Father's Day, drive the three and a half hours down to where I'm pastoring in Ohio. He gets there and they come to the evening service. My niece is with him and my mom and they're in the back row. He kind of got in in time for the service. And then I'm preaching, I'm bragging on my dad and I'm closing the service. And I said, okay, I'm going to call on my dad to close the service in prayer. And my niece had to bump him say, because he's sound asleep. <laughs> Grandpa! Uncle Dennis called on you to pray. My dad stood up and he prayed a great prayer and he sat right back down. No one knew but me, my niece, my mom, and my dad. But, you know, sometimes we're not paying attention because, man, we are just totally out. We're totally out. He's saying here, pay attention. This is the key phrase. You will do well to pay attention to your walk in Christ. In fact, he's going to say, you'll do well to pay attention to God's truth. I picked that up in verse 12, the verse before the one we just read. The truth you now have. So I got here for the truth, a pillar. We have this pillar of truth. And what really is our pillar of truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We need to be paying attention to Jesus every day in our lives. Pay attention to Jesus. He is the truth. I need to not only do that, but he says, Jesus said in John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them through your truth, your, your, through your word. Your word is truth. The Bible is the truth. Jesus is the truth. The Bible is the truth. I've never personally in a flesh and blood here met Jesus, but I've met him through the word. So in order to know the truth, the word, Jesus, I got to have the Bible. I got to know the truth and the word to know Jesus. In fact, Jesus said this, the truth will set you free. Now he said that to his disciples. If you're my disciples, the truth will set you free and you will be free indeed. Freedom comes from knowing Jesus. When you know the word, you know the truth. Now I'm always amazed at, uh, at, <clears throat> when it comes around to the Passion Week of Christ. And Jesus has been, you know, uh, going through his beatings and all, and he's standing before Pilate, and Pilate says to him, what is truth? Oh, my goodness. The living truth 
is standing right in front of him. You can't get it more clearly presented to you. Jesus is right there, and he says, what is true? You see, not everyone knows the truth. Not everyone knows the truth. That's kind of why we're doing the More to Life on um, telling my own story, how to, how to share my faith with other people, because most of the people in the world don't know the truth. They don't know Jesus. They just don't know Jesus. He tells us as the readers, because we know from the very beginning of this book, he's writing to Christians and he's saying, you need to pay attention to God's truth. You need to be reminded of God's truth. That's what Peter's doing here. He says, so I will always remind you of these things. He says, don't forget the truth. But he says, these things. And what are these things? That these things are what he's just talked about. We went over them last week. The goodness that he talked about. God has given you everything you need. Goodness is one of them. What is the goodness? He said, add to your faith goodness. And goodness, we saw last time, is moral excellence. Proposition three is not moral excellence. That's just Pastor Dave shared with us what, what he's gathered. Uh, I've read it too. It is not good. It is not good. It's just not moral excellence. It talks about the individual right. And as soon as they put that in without any qualification, it means a child in school can say that they think they're transgender and without the, the, the consent of a parent get hormone blockers that will make them sterile the rest of their lives without parents' knowledge. We've got to vote this down. The plus side on the other side is, hey, you can do anything you want. Give account to nobody. Sad day. Moral excellence. The next one is knowledge. The knowledge here is common sense, spiritual common sense. The next one is self-control, having mastery over your own being for the glory of God. The next one is perseverance, being able to endure all things for Christ's sake. The next one is godliness, which simply means being God-like. Kindness, which is brotherly love, and love, which is sacrificial love like God has in giving his son for us. He says, I'm going to always remind you of these things. This is the stuff that Christians are supposed to be made of. It's my job as the preacher to remind you of them. And that's why I'm a Bible preacher. And the value of what I'm teaching is what you read in the Bible and not in fancy stories or ear-tickling stories that make you feel good. It's in the Bible. He says, it's established truth. He says, you know them, know them, and you are firmly established in the truth. Firmly established. You are unmovable. You, you've read the word. You know the word. The truth is in you. He says, and you are unmovable. It reminds me of this man. Some of you remember who he is from when I put his picture up before. This is uh, the great reformer Martin Luther. And Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521 was being challenged by the, the church to retract what he was saying. He is a reformer. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He said, whoa, I've read the book of Romans and what we're practicing in the church and the book of Romans aren't the same. I'm going to go with the Bible. I'm going to go with Romans. And they're wanting him to retract that and the things that he said. And he says, basically at the Diet of Worms, I cannot. I wrote all that. I stand by that. The fact, this is the way he wrapped it up. He says, here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. He would not retract from the truth. Whoa. That is what he's saying. Unmovable. We know the truth. Why would we move from that? We are living in a day. A day in which there is no absolute truth. Truth is whatever you want the truth to be. But we know differently. The Word of God is the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. Firmly established. He says, even though you know them, you, you know this, sometimes what we know and what we do don't match. He's really saying you need to match what you know. He says, not only do you know that, but you have the truth. The truth you now have, and we have it in our Bibles our Bible is the truth. 
So everything I do in my faith, I look and see, is it right or wrong? You know, I, I've been challenged before, even as a pastor, a layman challenged me one time about something I said at church, and not too long ago, somebody said, you know, you always say, recite the Lord's Prayer. Why don't you say, pray the Lord's Prayer? Oh, good point. This is not just to be saying I'm reciting words on a page, you know, like uh, I would recite the preamble to the, the Constitution or part of the Declaration of Independence. I, this is a prayer. Why do I pray? And so he says, listen, you have the truth. And sometimes what your practice is and what the truth is are two different things. I don't try to force the truth to what I'm doing. I change what I'm doing to match the truth. That's why we have our Bibles, the truth. We want to rightly divide the truth, to know the truth. We want to share the truth, for it is the truth that will set people free. It's the refreshing truth, according to this passage. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Boop. That's what it is. Peter uses this metaphor that uh, my body's just a tent. Paul used it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the body is just a tent. John used it in John chapter 1 when it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means tabernacle. He tented among us. You know, I, the me, the ego, the person that I am inside, I'm attached to this body. Somehow, you know, it's me. I'm attached to the body. Death occurs when my immaterial part, the me, separates from this body. This body dies. They all view the body as just the tent that the me is in. I'm in this tent. And he says, one day, he says, I know because I know that I will soon put aside the tent. <laughs> the tent's going down. The older you get, the more you know it's going down. You know, I'm two years working on one crazy tooth in my mouth. And I don't know that they're going to have it fixed in two years. Because why? When I was a kid, I had all my teeth. And then I lost those baby teeth, and I got all these brand new teeth. And now they're putting in fake teeth. <laughs> why? Because the body is going down. That's what he's saying here. I know that I'm going to die. And he says, as Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Jesus told him that he's dying. He's going to die before he comes back. He told him that. I know that in John chapter uh, 21, he says, I tell you the truth. He's talking to Peter. Remember Peter? He told him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Right after, he says, I tell you the truth. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. And the picture here of the early Christians was the stretching out of the hands was to stretch out your arms to be crucified. And you remember the story from church history. The tradition was that when it came time for Peter to be crucified, he said, I don't want to die like my Savior died. I'm, not unwor I'm so unworthy. He said, crucify me upside down. So they nailed him to the cross and put the cross in upside down. And he died. He says, I know I'm going to die, he, said, he, he says. So, he says, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. He said, I want to leave a legacy. I'm writing this letter because I want you to know. Maybe those of us who have children that don't know the Lord should be writing our letter now so that when we die, maybe it's attached to the will. You've got to read this before it's out. You, get a, you get a cent. You get a dime. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we should be writing in our Bibles like my wife does. She's got a Bible for each one of the grandkids, and she writes special notes. In it. She, brings, she asks me when I'm doing a series. Oh, new series? Change Bibles. So she can write in that to the next grandkid, and she's going to leave that legacy behind they're going to have her bible they open it up and there's notes in there from her to them about what she's reading are you kidding me peter is doing the same thing he's saying listen i'm writing to you because i'm not going to be here always and i want you to know i want you to remember these things what are the, these things there they are faith 
You add to your faith goodness. What is goodness? Moral excellence. What do you add? Knowledge. Common spiritual sense. You've got to have common sense. Self-control. Self-mastery. What else? That you'll, be, you'll endure. You've got perseverance. That you'll be godlike. Godliness. Kindness. That's brotherly love. And then the love like God's got. Listen, he's saying here, I am writing these things so you'll have them after I'm gone. Thank God, or we wouldn't have this book. We would have this knowledge. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know this if he not, had not written it down. He says, pay attention to God's truth. And then it kind of turns the corner. He says, you've got to pay attention to God's voice. It's one thing to pay attention to the truth, but you, know, you read your Bible and you say, oh yeah, I've done that. Check that off. I've done that today. Check that off. But it's another thing to hear God speak from the truth to your life. You know what I'm saying? To hear him actually talk to you and say, uh, this is for you. This is for you. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. There are over 40 different Bible writers. And they wrote over approximately 1,500 years, a little longer than that, okay? Uh, Moses, who wrote... Um, well, wrote, he, he was born in 1526 B.C., and, and there were Job who wrote before him. So about 1,500 years, 40 different authors. Many times, he's saying, various ways God communicated. You see, God is speaking. He spoke to some but, but in a burning bush. Now, God never appeared to me in a burning bush. If the house is on fire, I'm calling 911, <laughs> you know? But he takes his shoes off and he approaches the bush, right? God spoke to him out of the bush. Later, he speaks to him out of a cloud. Later, he speaks to him uh, uh, from the tabernacle that is erected. Uh, he speaks to him up on the mountain. Uh, God spoke to him with the finger of God wrote on stone the Ten Commandments. And, and it's written. Uh, sometimes he, he tells the prophet, he speaks in their ears and nobody else hears them. Sometimes they see a, a dream they're sleeping and they're seeing what God wants them to ha see. Sometimes they're fully awake and they see the dream. And they have a vision. Uh, if you're the high priest, inside the breastplate, you'd reach inside and there were these two stones called the Urim and the Thummim. And you'd pull them out, also known as the light, uh, lights and perfections. Uh, one was a light stone, one was a dark stone, same texture, same kind of stone. The same size, and when they asked what the will of God was, they'd ask the priest the question, shall we go to battle or shall we hold back? And he'd reach in and pull out the white one, yes. Black one, no. God spoke to them in all sorts of different ways. And he says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us in Jesus Christ, his son. His son. It wasn't that Jesus just showed up. He was the revelation of God. His whole life speaks. He speaks to us. He speaks to us. Jesus is the revelation. He is God's voice. Now, Peter, coming back to Peter in 2 Peter, we were in chapter 1, verse 16, said we, uh, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he's coming back. He's talking about second coming here. He said, I didn't make this stuff up. I, I didn't make this stuff up. He says, I told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses. Now, this takes us back to the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 16, very last verse, Jesus says this to the disciples. I tell you the truth. Some of you standing here will not taste death before they have seen the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Wow. They're not going to see death until they see Him coming in His kingdom. Six days later, the next chapter says, Jesus is up on the mountain. He is transfigured and they see Him in all the glory that He is going to have when He comes back again. He's transfigured. His face is shining like the sun. There's this glow of his garments, all of his white garments, and there's a, a cloud that in, kind of engulfs them, and, and there's two figures that appear with him, Elijah and Moses. Now this tells me, you know what? If Peter and James and John who were with them, they saw them, and they immediately know, that's Moses, and that is, that, and that is Elijah. 
I'm convinced that when I get to heaven, I'm going to know who everybody is. I'm going to know which one's Moses. I'm going to know which one is Elijah. I'm going to know who Adam and Eve are, beside the fact that they don't have belly buttons. I'm going to... I'm going to know who all the people, I'm going to know who Samson is. I'm going to know who Daniel is. I'm, it's just, I'm going to know. I'm going to know who these people are. And I don't think they're going to be wearing name tags. He said, when the Lord appeared there, Moses and Elijah, and then all of a sudden something happened. There was a voice that cried out from heaven. He says, for we received the honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory of God the Father, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. If you read Matthew account, it adds this, Listen to him. Jesus speaks. Listen to him. God wants us to not only know the truth, we want to listen to his voice and what he is saying. And he goes on, he says, and we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We can read our Bibles in such a rush that we don't take time to allow God to say, this is for you. For a while, I was reading through the Pentateuch, got yeah, most of it done, where I would read the chapter and say, okay, now, this is what I heard God say to me today. And then I would jot down what God said to me. This is what I heard him say to me, to me, to me. He was on that mount in the transfiguration, and and old Peter sticks his foot in his mouth and says, maybe we should make a tabernacle for each of you. For you, Jesus, for Moses and Elijah. Whoa, that was the wrong thing to say. You can't put Moses and Elijah on a par of equality with Jesus. And all this whole thing shut down. Next thing you know, because they're, they're prostrate on the ground, they look up and there's only Jesus. And, uh, and, and uh, that, that was it. That was it. Now, we come to the next part. He says, not only do you pay attention to the truth, and you pay attention to God's voice, You've got to pay attention to God's Word. To God's Word. Listen to this. This is so powerful. His Word is certain. And we have the Word of the prophets made more certain. You've got to ask yourself, certain than what? He's saying the Word of God, written by the prophets, is more certain than the visions, the dreams, a transfiguration. That's gone. That's gone. He can't reproduce that. But he can pull out the Bible and say, look at here. Thus says the Lord. I have the more certain will of God. I don't have to depend on a dream or a vision or voices in my head. I have the Word of God. I can go to the Word of God that is certain and know exactly what the will of God is. He says, we have the Word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it. Pay attention to your Bible is the heart of what he's saying. I, I need to have my Bible open and reading and, and, and marking and learning and memorizing. Pay attention to it. Why? He says, as a light shining in a dark place. So I've installed night lights in the house. I don't want to find my wife at the bottom of the stairs again. And these night lights, they shine day and night. You know, they're LEDs, you know, they're low draw of electricity. And in the daytime, you don't even know that they're on. Because the daylight is so great. But in the middle of the night, when it is so dark, the one in the hall, we got to close our door because it'll keep us awake. But it's such a dim light in the daytime and such a bright light at night. And watch the text. As a light shining in a dark place. Do we live in a dark world? You bet. You bet. But the Word of God is the light. It shines in a dark place. And what happens? It shines that way until the dawn, day's dawn, just like our little night lights, they go out. I mean, they don't go out, they're shining. 
But when the daylight comes, it dominates over them. He says, in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. You know who the morning star is? The Revelation calls Jesus the morning star. Until Jesus rises in our heart, man, and then it takes over. Wow. I've been in the Word. It's enlightened me. Wow. And now Jesus has taken over because it's the Word of Christ, according to Romans chapter 10. It is the Word of Christ, the Bible. He's speaking to me, and it takes over. It's the illuminating Word of God. It lights up. It's like Psalm 119. It is a light unto my path. It is a light unto my path. His prophetic word here, this is what we got to pay attention to, His prophetic word. Above all, you must understand that prophecy of Scripture no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. He didn't just think this stuff up. Not on his own, he did not. I work on my sermons. If it's a bad one, I blame it on my wife. <laughs> you should have wrote me a better one. <laughs> As if she writes them. I work on my sermons. I try to uncover what the Scripture is saying and then preach the Word preach the word. In the book of Acts, Paul says, I failed not to preach to you the whole counsel of God. I didn't skip over anything. I touched on it all. When Paul was at the church of Thessalonica for maybe two, three, at the most four weeks, shy a couple of days, he covered every single major doctrine in a month. Woo! He preached it all. It's not like we see on TV today. It's always just positive, happy, make you feel good, motivational speaking or preaching. Paul preaches it all. All the prophets. All the truth. Every verse. It's all there. We want to skip over those genealogies. I'm, I'm sure he was preaching those genealogies too. Whew. Scripture, prophecy of Scripture, did not come about by the interpretation and the thoughts in the head of the prophets other than this. The Bible is God-breathed. Every word in the Bible is the Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. The Bible is like no other book on the planet. When you read it, you are reading the very Word of God. Powerful. Powerful. But Peter wants to tell you how that came about. He says, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. It never originated in the prophet himself. Often they were called seers because they saw what the Lord put there. That's what they wrote. Even when those who are writing like the book of Romans, the apostle Paul, it's a great logical argument for why you're a sinner and you need salvation and the sanctification of the Lord and ultimately the glorification. And once you got that all taken care of, he says, then this is how you should live in light of all of that. Even when he's writing all of that, it says they, that he was one of those men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> While he's writing along, God's carrying him. So every word that he put down was a word that God in heaven had intended. Powerful. He was carried along. When, when, when I was a boy, I, I, I attended a Dixon Elementary school and when I was like in the fourth and fifth grade well at our school they also had the junior high there were so many of us baby boomers that they built on to it and half our school was junior high and half of it was elementary and we'd see the junior high kids in shop making these really cool boats and so I went home and tried to describe it to my dad and I told my dad I want to build a boat but I'm not in junior high I can't do that my dad said well we can do that so we got down in the basement and he put the wood together, we glued the boards together, and when we cut them out, so it was a hollow hull, and, and we put a deck on it and all of that, and then I got impatient. That's about as far as my boat got. Uh, no sails, no rigging. It, it did have a keel on the bottom to keep it from uh, tipping over, but I decided, man, I'm ready. I don't need the rest of that stuff. I take it out and I put it in the swimming pool in the backyard. We had one of those above ground, 18 foot round swimming pools, and I put it in there, it just sat. Until I turned on the filter. 
And the filter had the jet that shot into the water and it began to circulate and there my boat took off. Wherever the water went, it carried my boat. And that's exactly what the text is saying. God the Holy Spirit took control of these men and carried them along so that every single word written down in the Bible was exactly what God the Holy Spirit wanted. It was all there, every bit. He used them like a pen in his hand. You know when I write? You know, every now and then I'll say, oh, I want to make this bold. I get a red pen out and I write some words in red. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go to a blue pen. Every now and then I'll pick up a green one. That's kind of different, right? And, and he used the authors, their personality, their style. Providentially, God had raised them so they had their own unique personality, their own unique style that he wanted to be in the Word of God because the Holy Spirit used them and carried them along so the exact words, the exact phrases, the exact concepts that are written in the Word of God is exactly what the Holy Spirit inspired and He wanted there. So it is the very Word of God. The very Word of God. So this is what I want you to take with you today. If you desire to have a living faith in your life, a live faith, not, not some dead faith, not, not a faith that was, oh yeah, years ago this was happening in my life, but God is active, involved in my life right now, a living faith, then you're going to have to pay attention to God's truth. In order to pay attention to God's truth, you're going to have to pay attention to His voice. Not simply what He said on the page, but He was saying on the page to you. What is God telling me here? What is God telling me? And finally, you've got to pay attention to God's Word. This is the Word of the Lord. This is God's truth. I can't say it enough. You need to be in your Bibles. I'll bet you watch TV more than you read your Bible. Ooh, now you're a meddling preacher. <laughs> Some of us probably read newspapers, magazines, more than we read the Word. And he's saying here, listen, I've left this legacy of the Word so that you will be reminded and refresh your memory of what you already know about the Lord and salvation, sanctification, glorification, the whole process. He says, pay attention to the Word. That's what I leave you with, pay attention to the Word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm so mindful the most powerful a couple of words in the Bible, simply that you spoke, God spoke. We're here listening, Lord, speak to us. When we open the Bible to read, speak to our hearts. It's a mirror, it shows us who we are. But Lord, some of us aren't going to the mirror to see ourselves and to see what you've done for us. And see what you'd like to still change in us. Help us, O oh Lord, to have a quiet time every day where we're in Your Word and You speak to us. And then, Lord, we take a little time and pray and just adore You and worship You, and confess our ways, and thank You for Your grace and Your mercy, Your goodness to us. Help us, O oh God, to today not go away seeing what manner of person that I am and then forget all about it but to go away and get into your word this I pray in Jesus name amen